Hello, hello. Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. And I'm looking forward to t visiting with you tonight. I hope you're doing well. I'm going to give folks a minute to log on. Hello, Mr. Ryan. I hope you're doing well. Hope you had a good day. Uh, and I hope everyone is staying cool. And I hope everyone is staying hydrated. And I hope everyone is enjoying uh, the outdoors uh, some safely and uh, staying healthy while they do it. We're going to be in Psalm 127 in just a minute. I'm going to, uh, Psalm 126, excuse me. I'm going to uh, shut those doors behind me and then uh, get started. There's my, your favorite uh, church member, my favorite church member. And uh, what are you looking for? I actually accidentally took it and didn't bring it back. I'd give her husband one tomorrow. Shut those doors, would you please? All right. Hello, Evelyn. Hello, Joyce. Hello, Kelly. Hello, Kristen. And uh, welcome to a bunch of you. Hello, Jessica. Glad you're here. Uh, let's go ahead and look at Psalm 126. Before we do, I'll just mention a couple of quick reminders. Uh, first of all, um, Wednesdays is going to continue online, even though we're going to have a live in-person Wednesday night service for six Wednesdays, July 15th through August. Hello, Donna. Uh, so I'm excited about live and in-person Wednesday night services. Uh, those will happen starting on July 17th, uh, July 15th. They will be uh, at 7 o'clock in the main auditorium. We'll have a full children's program that I'm very excited about. And we will also have our program for teenagers on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. We're calling it Wednesdays in the Word. And we're inviting our entire church, every age bracket, every life stage, to join us on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock for Wednesdays in the Word. And then uh, we I want you to know that if online works better for you, if online works better for you, that's fine. Uh, you can join us at 7 o'clock online each Wednesday. There will be most of us gathered together in the main auditorium at the church for Wednesday night Bible study. And those of you that would like to watch online can do that either on Facebook or YouTube or howellchurch.org slash live. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll jump into Psalm 126. Heavenly Father, thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you for a wonderful church family. Thank you for the beautiful weather. The sunshine is a reminder of your goodness and the warmth of your love. And uh, we thank you for uh, the health and the strength that you've given us. We also thank you for your grace to uh, enable us to uh, be faithful to you, to one another, I do pray that you'd meet the needs in our church family. I pray for Yvonne Bins, that you'd give her strength and comfort and grace and help, as well as her children and grandchildren. I pray that you would comfort them as the God of all comfort. I pray that you would bless our study tonight in Psalm 126. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the privilege to open your word tonight with brothers and sisters in our family. And I thank you for making us your sons and daughters and part of the same family with the Lord Jesus Christ as our head. We pray these things in his name, amen. All right. Yeah, hi, Jeff. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I shaved on Monday. And uh, so I think and I hope I look younger. That's what I was going for uh, because I kind of liked the beard, but it was kind of supposed to just be a uh, quarantine uh, uh, coronavirus beard. It, it kind of served as a filter to prevent the germs from entering my uh, pores. But uh, I thought that it was time to shave because of um, the warmer weather and the brighter sunshine. And so uh, Nicole and I celebrated our anniversary on Sunday. So we went away for two nights and on Monday morning I shaved for the first time since March 15th. And uh, well, I'm not sure yet if I'm glad uh, uh, if I'm glad that I shaved, but um, we will uh, we will see. Um, ja, uh, Psalm 126. Let's uh, get into it. Psalm 126. 
I'm going to read the first three verses of the psalm and then give you the context. When the Lord turned the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. I love this psalm. This psalm is one of a set of psalms in the 120s that was sung by the Jewish believers as they traveled up the elevation climb toward Jerusalem to worship at the annual feasts and celebrations that would be hosted by the Jewish people at the Jewish temple. Bible students are not sure exactly which occasion of deliverance this psalm was written for, but I'm gonna share a couple of options that it might have been here in just a moment. But I like what it says in verse one. It mentions that we are like those who dream. This psalm was a celebratory, happy, uh, jubilant praise by the people of Israel over what God had done for them. And they said we were like those who dream. I wonder, do you dream? Do you dream at night? I do. I've learned that not everyone does, and some people dream often, and some people dream seldom. I dream, I think, every time I sleep. And I'm not sure that's a good sign. I think that means my mind is always going. But uh, I've had bad dreams that I'm glad when I wake up they're not true. All right? You have too. I've had weird dreams that could not possibly be true. Uh, oftentimes, I uh, think I'm, in my dream I'm flying. It's always disappointing to discover that I can't fly when I wake up. And then I've had wonderful dreams that sometimes I wish were true. And you've had dreams in all three of those categories, I bet. One of my most common bad dreams is that I've forgotten to set an alarm and I'm late for an important meeting. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that's a problem. Another one of the bad dreams I've often had is that I'm in the pulpit at our church or at another place. I've had moments where we say, wow, I almost feel like this is too good to be true. I will say that not every day in life is like that, is it? But most of us who have uh, maybe welcomed a newborn child into the world, into our family, or uh, witnessed a marriage ceremony for someone we love, or maybe our own marriage ceremony on the day of our wedding. Uh, you still there? All right. I made an adjustment. We'll uh, hopefully stay tuned. Uh, but most of us know what it's like to feel like something almost too good to be true happened. And it was like a dream that was coming true. And that's what was taking place for the Jewish people on the occasion of the writing of this psalm. This psalm is speaking of the Lord delivering the Jewish people from a threat. The Bible says the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion. Zion is referring here to the people of God. Zion was uh, a name describing especially that which took place in and around the city of Jerusalem. And it it's, has a more broad description of the people of Israel, uh, Zion, the nation of Israel. And he says, the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, uh, meaning that things were headed in the wrong direction and God turned it around. It was headed into a direction of captivity and God turned it around. Uh, one of two likely possibilities when the Psalm was written. The Jewish people went into captivity at the hands of the Babylonians uh, and they were under captivity. Uh, that You can read about that in the closing chapters of uh, uh, first and second, or uh, closing chapters of Second Kings, they were taken into captivity uh, under Jewish uh, captivity at the hands of the Babylonians when King Nebuchadnezzar ruled uh, the Babylonian kingdom. 
after 70 years, they were permitted by King Cyrus to return to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple and to resettle their homeland. It was a miracle. It was an answer to prayer. And it was a delight to the people to be returning finally in small uh, factions to their homeland. Ezra the priest led their uh, caravan and led the efforts at rebuilding the Jewish temple. That is probably the occasion at which this psalm was written. Uh, the other possibility is that when uh, the Assyrians were bearing down on Jerusalem, when Hezekiah was the king, this is well before the Babylonian captivity, the Assyrians had already taken captive the northern kingdom, and now they were coming at the, Jew at the southern kingdom, where Jerusalem was the capital, and the Assyrians were threatening. Isaiah the prophet informed Hezekiah of the approaching Assyrians, and Hezekiah prayed, and God delivered the city of Jerusalem from the attack of the Assyrian king. 185,000 soldiers lost their lives in the Assyrian army at, as an act of God. And it was a great deliverance that was just too good to be true when you considered the fact that this was a brutal, murderous, violent, uh, attacking army that took no prisoners and that was destroying every kind of a, uh, a person or a city in their way on their conquest of that part of the world. And so the Lord delivered the Jewish people in that moment. Whichever case it was, this psalm was written in a moment when Jewish people were grateful for what God had done for them. And I believe there's a parallel application for believers. We, as the Church of Jesus Christ, are not Israel. However, we do know that the Old Testament was written for our example. Paul tells us that in his letters. And so we can glean lessons about our unchanging God throughout the ups and downs of Israel's history. And so the parallel for us as believers is that God has delivered us. Jesus Christ delivered us from the bondage and the captivity of sin. And it really is just too good to be true. It seems like it that way, at least. And yet, we are like those who dream. It's a dream come true to know that Jesus Christ is your Savior, your sins are forgiven, and your home is in heaven, and your past is not going to haunt you, and your future is secure, and that your life and your days are in the hands of an omnipotent, sovereign God. Now, let's look at these three verses again and know what I just told you about these verses. And let's discover four things that are present when dreams come true. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. There are four elements present when dreams come true. The first element is a good God. Maybe you want to write down on a piece of scratch paper on your margin of your Bible next to Psalm 126. In this Psalm, there is, number one, a good God. You know, everything good begins with God. The Bible says here that the Lord turns something around. Isn't it wonderful that the Lord turns things around? Everything good in your life, everything good in my life is a gift from Almighty God, James chapter 1 says. Whenever the Lord begins moving and working, good things are happening. And that's one of the reasons that you and I as believers can have faith, even in the midst of difficulty, is that God is always working all things together for our good. Psalm 86, 5, Thou, Lord, art good. Uh, Ephesians 2 says that it is God's desire that he would show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. You know, God's goodness is, is extended to all people in some ways. His tender mercies are over all his works. The Lord is good to all. But for those who are in Christ, those who know Jesus as their Savior, there is a father relationship that delights in giving good things, Matthew seven eleven, to those who ask him. 
If God is your father, you can be thankful that you have a good God. In this passage, we see this good God. Psalm, one, Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You can trust the Lord. You can trust the Lord through difficult circumstances. You can trust the Lord through situations that you have no control over. You can trust the Lord. Circumstances won't always be good, but God will always be good. The economy won't always be good, but God will always be good. Relationships won't always be going good, but God is always good. And we can praise him for it. We can rest in that. You say, well, I'm in a moment right now where things aren't going well. Be patient. Be patient. In due season, Galatians 6, 9 says. Lamentations 3 says this. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to those who seek him. Sometimes you have to wait for him. Sometimes you have to seek him while you're waiting for his goodness to be seen. So in this psalm, we see four things that are present when dream comes true, dreams come true. Number one, we see a good God. Number two, we see great things, great things. It says here, he turned again to captivity. No one could have done that but God. Uh, it says in verse two of the three verses we read, uh, they said among the heathen, the Lord has done great things for us. Psalm 126 verse three, the third verse that we read says, the Lord has indeed done great things for us. Job 37 says that great things does the Lord. Ephesians 3 tells us that he is exceeding abundantly above, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. God does great things. And I have to be careful when I say God does great things because sometimes his definition of great and our definition of great are different, okay? Don't let the 21st century modern day American materialistic culture tell you what kinds of great things you should expect from God. Otherwise, you're moving over into the health and wealth prosperity theology that says that you should expect God to make you rich and healthy and prosperous and popular and happy and uh, have lots of things and lots of money. And that's the way God blesses. Though you know, sometimes when people have been blessed, those are things they can enjoy but that is not the chief way. And those are not the greatest things that God does for his children. God does great things for us. We have a great God. I think about uh, dreams coming true. And I think about how our, our dreams mature over time. I remember when I was in elementary school and junior high, I dreamed about what life would be like as an adult when I could make my own decisions and live on my own schedule and not have to go to school every day. I thought, well, what's life gonna be like? Well, for sure, I'm going to have a convertible. But, well, that's, that's kind of an established thing. I'll have a convertible. And I'll probably have a real pretty wife. At least, hey, one, one out of two is not bad, right? I'll probably have a real pretty wife and probably live in a real contemporary, modern, uh, unique house. And uh, that'll be good. And probably go out to dinner and play on the weekends and spend some time on the lake or something like that. Those were the dreams of a junior high. Having money and having things and having cars and, 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 and that, that sometimes that's shaped by the culture in which we live. As you grow more mature, your dreams mature and they become about more meaningful things, right? Your, your dreams as you move into adulthood become more about the quality of your relationships than the quantity of your possessions, for example, or your accomplishments. Your dreams mature. And I would say just like all individuals' dreams mature over their growth of their life, I would also say that as you grow spiritually, your dreams are going to become more sanctified. The dreams that you have are going to become more about dreams that God also has for you and for those around you. And, and, and your dreams will shift from things coming your way to more being about God receiving glory and his kingdom being advanced and people having his touch in their lives 
whether those people are people in your own home or people that you influence during the course of your life. Your dreams come more into line with what's important to God. But, but suffice it to say, when you come to Psalm 126, you see a good God and you see great things. When I think about great things, I'm thinking about uh, lives being transformed. I'm thinking about souls being saved. I'm thinking about people, Christians being discipled. I'm thinking about people's, the trajectory of people's future going from a path away from the Lord onto a path of upward following of the Lord. When I think about great things, I'm thinking about his praises being lifted with his people. I'm thinking about people who don't know the Lord coming to know and love and follow and serve and glorify the Lord. I'm thinking about our community being impacted with the gospel. And I'm thinking about lifting up uh, uh, people spiritually and helping people know the Lord and honor the Lord and follow the Lord. Those are the great things that I think we could uh, envision. I think of the next generation. Uh, young people who maybe from the point of infancy or uh, all the way up to people that are teenagers and young adults coming behind the rest of us to know and honor and follow and love and live for and serve Jesus Christ. These are great things. And I would just say this. I believe Psalm 126 teaches us that we should not limit the greatness of our God. Don't limit how God can bless and use our lives for his glory and for his kingdom. God's greatness can do amazing things. We should never forget God's greatness. Psalm 106 says they forgot God their Savior who did great things. And I do think sometimes we can forget all the great things God has done for us. You know, a lot of times we've been so blessed we forget that the things that God has done for us that are great, we forget how cherished they should be. And we begin taking them for granted. And we sometimes are like those people in Israel who forgot the great things that their God had done. I like what Samuel said to the people of Israel. He said, consider the great things God's done for you. It's actually not all he said. In 1 Samuel 12, 24, he said, consider the great things God's done for you. But right before that, he said, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart for consider the great things he's done for you. So considering the great things God's done for us should trigger in our hearts a fear or an awe and reverence of God. And it also should trigger a desire to delight in him to serve him, to love him, to know him better, to follow him more fully, and to honor and glorify him with all of our days. So in this Psalm 126, in the first three verses, we see a, uh, a good God, we see great things, and then we see glad people. Verse two, our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Verse three, the Lord did great things for us, whereof we are glad. A glad people in whose lives God has worked. Psalm 92 says something similar. You've made me glad, Lord, through your works. Moses told the children of Israel, you shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord's given you. We've just talked about a good God who does great things, and that should produce a glad people who wear smiles on their faces and joy on their hearts. Gladness should be a characteristic of God's people. Now, that doesn't mean that, that the Christian life is easy or that it is just uh, fun-filled. Sometimes it is something that is to be endured and burdens are to be borne but the Christian life can be a joy-filled life. And Paul, 22 times in the book of Philippians, said uh, that we should rejoice or have joy. Peter in 1 Peter 4, written to suffering persecuted Christians, he says, rejoice and be glad, even though you're suffering. He says, happy 
are ye, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. So here's a good thing to remember from Psalm 126. Your gladness isn't the responsibility of other people. Your gladness doesn't come from good circumstances. Your gladness comes from a good God. And your gladness comes from walking closely with the Lord and focusing your attention on Him. It's a great day in your life when you determine that your joy is not based on the things going around around you, but rather what God is doing in you. For some people, being glad is a response to their circumstances. If the circumstances are good, they're glad. If the circumstances are bad, they're sad. But what if your gladness was a response to the Holy Spirit's ministry in your heart? Because he has said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And the Bible does say the fruit of the Spirit is joy. I believe Christians can be glad people even in the midst of difficulty or suffering. And one of the reasons I know they can is because I've known so many wonderful Christian people who through such difficult situations have maintained the joy of the Lord. And I thought to myself, when my times for suffering come, I want to be able to demonstrate the joy of the Lord that transcends circumstances. It doesn't mean the burdens aren't heavy. It doesn't mean the grief isn't real, but it means my joy comes from the Lord. Psalm 9, verse 2, I will be glad and rejoice in thee. Psalm 31, 7, I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy. We are taught in the scriptures to receive our joy and gladness from the Lord, from his goodness, from his graciousness. People aren't always good. People aren't always gracious. People aren't always generous. People aren't always kind. People aren't always thoughtful. But the Lord is always all those things. And so we find our joy in him. In Psalm 126, we see three, we see four things that are present when dreams come true. When things are just going so great that it feels like there's a dream coming true, we see four things are present. A good God, great things, glad people, and a glorified Lord. Verse two of our text says, then said they among the heathen, that is the unbelievers who are watching us, the Lord has done great things for them. Picture this, the Jewish people have been delivered. Whether it was the deliverance of the armies uh, of the Jewish people against the armies of Hezekiah, uh, of uh, the Assyrians, Sennacherib, King Sennacherib, or whether it was the deliverance of the Jewish people out of Babylon, migrating back to their homeland, Whatever it was, whichever situation it was, there were people outside of Israel who saw all of this take place and they said, hmm, the Lord has done great things for those people. What a great thing for people to see. The Lord has done great things for them. You know, when your Christian life is, is bearing fruit and experience, experiencing gladness, and when the good things God has done for you are bringing joy to your life and your life is following the Lord, people begin to take notice. And it gives you an opportunity to witness for him. I mentioned this on Sunday. I think that's why Peter said to the suffering believers, when someone asks you, be ready to answer, when someone asks you of the hope that is in you, the world watches the people of God. And when the world watches the people of God have hope and peace and joy in the midst of difficulty, they say, I wonder why they have hope. I wonder why they're so glad. It's almost like they must know something I don't know. They must have something I don't have. Now you need to witness to people whether they ask or not. But sometimes the joy and the good and great work of our God on the inside and in our lives gives us an opportunity, a platform with which to witness. I believe God blesses us and does great things in our lives because number one, he loves us. Number two, because he desires to draw us closer to him. And number three, so that he will receive glory. 
He told the people of Israel that through the prophet Isaiah. He said, you will inherit the land. You will inherit the work of my hands that I may be glorified. The chief end of man, it has been said, is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. I think one of the most effective advertising campaigns is uh, the testimonial. If you have some retired athlete like Joe Montana telling people on the television ad that he wears this elastic band on his elbow and all of a sudden uh, he, he has no joint pain. Uh, that's a testimonial. And people flock to purchase the thing that Joe Montana said worked. Uh, some uh, person tells you about the this magical cleaner that uh, in, in my shower used to be covered in green fungus and then I sprayed this cleaner on the shower and all of a sudden in seconds it disappeared and it sparkles. That's a testimonial and people flock to buy the product. Well, the Christian, the believer in Jesus Christ whose life is being transformed, who's bearing the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, goodness, meekness, temperance. When the believer is experiencing this life, that is the testimonial so that other people may see what the Lord is doing in their lives and understand that God's doing something good in this person's life. God is doing a work in this person's life and it's a testimonial. When the wall was completed around the city of Jerusalem under the leadership of Nehemiah, the Bible says that on the day the wall was completed, they had a celebration and the Bible says this, I love this expression. The Bible says, the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. People heard the noisy celebration in Jerusalem. We should make some noise. We should be joy-filled people whose lives are a testimony that God is work. God is at work. That doesn't mean that we don't carry burdens, have problems, or face roadblocks, or setbacks. What it means is our good and gracious God is with us through every step of the way. And mostly, His Son, Jesus Christ, has once and for all delivered us from sin and set us on a path to heaven so that through the ups and downs of life, we are citizens of heaven and we are headed to our final home. And that should cause us to square our shoulders back keep our chin up, and keep marching toward glory, taking others with us as we possibly can. I would encourage you, continue dreaming for the Lord. Continue allowing yourself to rejoice in and yearn for the good work of our great God in your life. Psalm 126, we were like those who dream. Our mouth was filled with laughter. Our tongue was filled with singing. The heathen saw it and said, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. I hope that encourages you about your Lord and about his good work in your life. Uh, I uh, want to remind you that every Wednesday we'll be gathering at seven o'clock online, July 15th, that's two weeks from tonight, through August, that's six Wednesdays, we will also have in-person worship and we will be broadcasting online the in-person worship service. We'll have a program for the kids that they can invite their friends and neighbors to. We will also have um, our teens studying the Word every Wednesday night as well at 7 o'clock. We're calling it Wednesdays in the Word and it's every Sunday, every Wednesday at 7 beginning two weeks from tonight in person at church. We reconfigured the chairs today, and so we're all set for Sunday services. I want to remind you about our Sunday schedule. We have uh, three services on Sunday, and these services are going to be arranged with social distancing measures, and uh, we have reduced the seating capacity in the auditorium, and uh, we spread them out today, and I think you'll find it very effective, and our services on Sunday are at 8.30, 10, and 11.30, we have full child care at 10 o'clock, and we have teen class during the 1130 service. So plan accordingly. We are in a five-week series on Philippians chapter 4. Sunday is the midpoint, so don't miss it. 
the first week. And by the way, these messages are available here on the Facebook page and also uh, in the archives on YouTube, so you can find the messages there. We're in a five-week series on the really good life. We learn in Philippians chapter 4 that the really good life includes relational harmony. Then on Sunday, we learned that the really good life includes inner peace. And then this Sunday, we're going to learn that the really good life includes healthy thinking. And so that'll be Sunday, 8.30, 10, and 11.30. It's going to be a great day, and uh, I hope you have a great week. Let's keep praying for each other, and uh, thank you for your encouraging and, and kind words to me, and also for your thoughtfulness toward each other. If there's something I can do for you or pray for you about, please let me know. Send me a message on Facebook. Send me an email, pastor at howellchurch.org. Let me know what I can do to be an encouragement to you. I hope you uh, caught us on Sunday. Just in case you, you didn't catch some of the announcements on Sunday, we are planning baptisms on July 19th. If you're interested or have questions, let me know. We have communion on July 26th in all three of our Sunday morning services. And then on July 26th, we also have, also have our mid-year business meeting at 1245 with a financial update. And uh, so we're looking forward to those things. And then we have our summer open house in the pastor's backyard on Saturday, uh, uh, July 25th. I look forward to that as well. Have a great night and uh, God bless you. Thanks for joining me online tonight.